Hello and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be taking a look at the midterm elections and whether or not Republicans are on track for a 1994 style of midterm. And of course, what I mean by that is a clean sweep in both the House and the Senate, as well as contesting key Democratic districts and states. And in some cases, we are seeing the ingredients for a significant wave in favor of the Republicans, especially with the polling bump that they've gotten in the past couple of weeks. So we're going to take a look at that. We're going to take a look at some polls as well as some of the key ratings for a lot of these races, both by RCP and 538, that would indicate that Republican momentum could be strong enough to see the biggest Republican wave we have since 1994. So of course, before we get into it, as always, if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing down below and liking this video if you enjoy. We're just seven days away from the midterm election. So from now until election day, we'll be uploading twice a day. We'll do one video in the afternoon and one video in the evening. So stay tuned for those. We'll be posting two a day. I'll put reminders in the community tab for the videos we post. So anyway, let's get straight into it. So 1994 was so significant because the Republican Revolution, as it was dubbed, led to Republicans taking back the House and Senate for the first time since the Dwight Eisenhower administration. And Republicans hadn't held the House in over four decades. So this was no small task for the GOP to pull off, especially because the Democrats essentially had the House of Representatives on lock since the 1950s. And of course, one of the reasons why they were able to make a lot of these districts so competitive was a strategy that Newt Gingrich devised, which was to nationalize these races because oftentimes these down ballot races would typically go to a candidate of you know either party a lot of times incumbents would basically have their districts for life it was a very different time politically speaking back in the 1990s the early 1990s rather before this and newt gingrich nationalizing the midterm elections against bill clinton because bill clinton's first administration was a very liberal one the clintons tried to pass a universal health care bill they banned assault weapons there was a number of things that went on during the first term of bill clinton that sort of shocked a lot of republicans into action because bill clinton obviously campaigned as more of this moderate uh business democrat and then when he got into office passed a lot of key liberal legislation with his democratic trifecta which of course angered a lot of Republicans. So they got together and organized and were able to pull off one of the biggest election victories for the GOP really since the 1920s. So will the Republicans make history like that this year? Probably not. I don't think so. But of course, in this video, we're going to take a look at some of the similarities that we are seeing between the 94 midterms and the 2022 midterms. Now, if you watched my video on the generic ballot about two days ago, I predict that the generic ballot will favor Republicans by about four points. Of course, if we go back to the 1994 House elections, the generic ballot was significantly redder than that. The generic ballot in this case favored the Republicans by a little less than seven percentage points. So, you know, a redder ballot overall, but that had much more of an impact back then, especially because a lot of traditionally Democratic districts uh, really in the South and Midwest uh, were able to be flipped by the Republican Party because of this nationalization strategy, because they made the race about Bill Clinton and the Democrats and tying all of these Democrats, even these more conservative Democrats in the South to Bill Clinton and ultimately it ended up taking them down. And this was a strategy that the Republicans would replicate in 2010 and 2014, which basically destroyed the Blue Dog Coalition, where you had a lot of these Democrats that were uh, down south in very red districts that were able to survive for previous cycles with their more moderate record, but just being tied to Obama and the more liberal Democratic Party in Washington overall was really the death nail for them. So we really don't have the same landscape like that anymore. Of course, our districts are very polarized. A lot of the toss-up districts in favor of either party, the purple districts are purple districts. There's no real safe blue or red districts that are being realistically contested, although there's a number of ones. Uh, PA's 12th comes to mind. There's a couple others, I think. Um, Tonko's district, upstate New York. There's a couple of districts that the Republicans actually are putting some money in that are safe Democratic districts that they're trying to contest, which if you follow the money in politics, it will usually lead you uh, toward what's actually going on. And of course, in this midterm cycle, uh, with that being the case, I think the Republicans are feeling very confident about their chances at this point in time. If they're investing in races that are safe Democratic, 
Pennsylvania's 12th, which voted for Biden by over 20 points, but has a very progressive Democrat uh, in charge. And there's an another, a couple of other unique factors in that race as well. Maybe I'll do a separate video on it at some point, but I think I did talk about it in my Mid-Atlantic House predictions. But uh, there's a number of uh, safe Democratic districts that are being contested now. I know the one upstate is probably being contested because of Lee Zeldin and the hope that Republicans have that Lee Zeldin will have a strong performance in the state of New York and ultimately his coattails will bring uh, that Republican over the finish line. So looking at 538 now, we'll take a 538 and then we'll look at RCP. But so far we are looking at a similar outcome to 1994 in which Republicans win back both the Senate and the House. Of course, the House was really a foregone conclusion since the end of the 2020 election, since the Republicans came so close to taking back the House in 2020, despite Joe Biden winning the popular vote by 4.5%. So you're talking about a plus four Democratic environment where Republicans almost won the House. And of course, now with redistricting, there's some states that are better for the Democrats, but there's a decent amount that are also better for the Republicans. So uh, looking at where we are today, the Republicans basically have a 50-50 shot, according to 538. And 538 tends to be the more left-leaning of these political uh, predictive sites, basically. Uh, RCP is much more bullish on the Republicans' chances. They have Republicans uh, with 31 governorships. We'll take a look at their Senate projection, which is 53 to 47. They have Republicans flipping Nevada, Arizona, and Georgia, holding on to Pennsylvania. That's been my projection pretty consistently for months, uh, and I still stand by it because now we're starting to see the polling surge sort of kick in where Republicans are not only doing better nationally according to the RCP average, they're starting to surge. And these aren't just right-wing polls. Some people argue that these are just right-wing polls, but Data for Progress is a left-wing poll that happens to be very accurate. Of course, you have the CBS Battleground Tracker that has Republicans up too. So overall, the trend is in favor of the Republicans. Of course, you're going to have outliers that have the Democrats up ahead, especially when you're surveying registered voters. But overall, you'd rather be the Republican Party now than the Democrats. The momentum is certainly shifting in their favor. And of course, you have the incumbent governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham, only up by two points. So in a lot of these states, uh, you're starting to see, and, and New Mexico is a likely to safe Democratic state, depending on your categorization, and yet Republicans are on track to potentially defeat an incumbent there. And of course, you've got a number of other states as well. Of course, you've got uh, governor's races in particular, where I think the Republicans are doing exceptionally well. The only state I think they're really doing poorly in that they could be doing better in is the state of Pennsylvania. I think that's the one race the Republicans really let go uh, by nominating such a poor candidate. But in Michigan, things are looking better for the GOP. 538 doesn't say it, but the RCP average has uh, Whitmer only up by about three points. And, you know, I still expect her to hold on, but that's not really a comfortable position for a Democrat, especially when you take into account the fact that Michigan tends to overestimate Democrats in its polling. Of course, in Wisconsin, 538 has Evers' favorite. I think he loses by about three points. A lot of these governor's races, I think Republicans are going to do fairly well. Um, Oregon, especially, they have a really strong candidate in Christine Drazen. Uh, that's a bit interesting, though. I will make a separate video on Oregon because there is sort of this polling shift now where you're starting to see that Johnson could slightly be taking more votes from Drazen and actually hurting her, allowing Tina Kotek to squeak by in this race just based on the partisan lean. But when we're talking about 1994, we're talking about Republicans not just contesting but winning safe blue states around the country. And it seems as of right now, the only state that the Republicans are certainly in a good chance to win is Oregon. Obviously, in the state of New York, you have Lee Zeldin. He's a very strong candidate, but New York is a very, very blue state. And it's not nearly as elastic as it was back in 1994, where you had George Pataki beating incumbent governor Mario Cuomo by over three percentage points. Again, this map really wouldn't be possible in today's New York. You'd never see Westchester go red in today's New York. Long Island, these margins could possibly happen, you know, getting uh, just under 60% for a Republican. But there was a significant third party factor in this race as well. And Republicans uh, benefited from that, especially on places like the island, because Mario Cuomo still didn't get the majority of the vote, despite how well he did statewide. He still only got 48% of the vote. So the third party has really hurt Mario Cole more than her Pataki, but this is a race that a lot of people have been talking about. I'm probably going to make one last video on New York before the election because uh, things are increasingly getting even better for Lee Zeldin. Uh, I'll talk about whether I think that race is realistically winnable, but right now I think the only safe blue state the Republicans have a really good shot to win in the governorship is Christine Drazen. 
She's at 50, 50, and 538, which goes to show you that she's probably ahead and she'll probably end up pulling it out at the end of the day. Of course, if we look at RCP, their current governor's production has Christine Drazen flipping that seat. Nevada, Kansas, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Republicans losing Massachusetts and Maryland. Now, like I hinted earlier, one of the main differences between 94 and obviously this year is that states are much more politically partisan. States like New York, Illinois, these are now blue states. And it's very hard for Republicans to win there unless they run very liberal campaigns. And of course, you have a lot more voters who are less open to voting for the opposite party than they would have been back in 1994. You had very different voter coalitions. You had middle class voters who were high propensity voters, well educated, uh, really going hard for the GOP. So in these sort of midterms post 94, Republicans did very well in these statewide races. Now those high propensity middle class voters are increasingly voting more Democratic. That's hurting the GOP. That's one of the reasons why the special elections were such a disaster for the Republicans in the post row environment. It certainly looks like the Republicans have recovered, at least polling wise, from that. Just because the midterm fundamentals finally kicked in. Uh, abortion was a big issue over the summer. Now the big issues are the economy, crime, inflation. Uh, those are the top three issues for voters. Abortion has kind of fallen in most polls in the fourth or fifth place. And, and you know, people that usually regard abortion as their top issue are typically voters that vote Democratic anyway. So it's not like the Republicans are losing that many voters uh, off of the Roe v. Wade decision. If anything, it's all a game about turnout. That's really what midterms are. But I don't particularly think this is going to be a 1994 style midterm. The only way I could see this being categorized as a 94-esque sort of midterm is if we see states like Rhode Island in the governorship, New York in the governorship uh, flip, a state like Washington or Colorado flip in the Senate, then you could argue that's a real red tsunami. That's a 94 style Republican wave year. But at this point, I don't really see that happening. I see a red wave happening similar to 2010 or 2014, uh, but it's very predictable. Again, 53 to 47 in the Senate. Uh, that's where I stand. That's where I think we're going to be on election night or a couple days after when the votes get tabulated. But I don't think you're going to see this massive red tsunami. And, you know, if Republicans, perhaps if Roe v. Wade wasn't overturned, uh, we would see a much better generic ballot for the GOP, a lot more independent voters perhaps jumping in their camp. And ultimately, maybe you would have seen uh, races like New, New York's governor, for instance, flip or something like that, certain Senate races, perhaps Colorado's Senate race get closer. But I think as a nation, we're just too politically partisan for really deep blue states like Washington or Colorado to flip and potentially New York and Rhode Island to flip in the governorships. Now, governor's races are more local. It's one of the reasons why you're seeing Josh Shapiro lead Doug Mastriano by a massive margin. But Fetterman's lead is basically evaporated to a dead heat with Dr. Oz in the Senate. That's a federal race. Dr. Oz is a stronger candidate than Mastriano. So uh, there's different dynamics at play than what we saw in 1994. Of course, 1994 was so historic because it was the first time in 40 years Republicans had both the House and the Senate under their control. So do I think we're going to see something that revolutionary this cycle? Probably not, but it's not impossible. Again, if Republicans, by some divine intervention, flip states like New York or Rhode Island or something like that, then perhaps maybe you can make that argument provided everything else happens that's predicted to happen. Republicans get 53, 54 seats in the Senate, and then you have those uh, surprise flips, then you could argue it was a very big wave year for the GOP. But as of now, I stand by just a typical red wave. I don't think you're going to see something extremely massive. This could age poorly in about 10 days or so when we get the results back. But as of right now, that's where I'm sticking. Uh, but we'll see what ends up happening. So anyway, thank you all for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please leave a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification so you don't miss any more videos I put out. Link down below to our election night live stream. Please set your reminders for that. If you're interested, like that stream down below. Of course, we'll be streaming all night on election night starting at 7 p.m. Eastern following those election night returns. So be sure to join us for that. It should be a lot of fun. We'll get the channel Discord going in a couple of days, release that. Uh, hope you guys join or are interested in that as well. Anyway, again, thank you all for watching this video and I hope to see you in the next one.